was hard coming home. Uh, I think many of you know me, but for those who don't, um, my background is that I uh, started my work career serving my time to the fitting trade of the Ulster Transport Authority in the late 50s, completed that apprenticeship in the early 60s, but then promptly left to join the Engineering Employers Association, which was an association for employers in Northern Ireland, but part of a national Engineering Employers Federation set up. Uh, by the, after some 20 odd years, I then came back to transport industry, and specifically Ulster Bus in the 80s, uh, when I became personnel manager. Um, I took early retirement with uh, significant changes taking place some 10, 11 years later, uh, but did come back to the company in a uh, sort of private capacity to carry out some uh, investigations into the bus services around Belfast, courtesy of my former colleague sitting in front of me, Irvine Miller. I'm going to talk about bus reservation in Northern Ireland rather than specific buses and you'll hopefully forgive me uh, if I keep looking down and reading from uh, uh, some notes I have really to enable me to ensure I don't miss anything that I think is relevant. Preservation really, and I'm looking at it purely from a Northern Ireland point of view, probably breaks down to two distinct types. First of all, you have the museum, the museum which is generally open to the public, um, and specifically looking at Northern Ireland, we would be looking at the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum. In England, National Railway Museum is a good example, again, of a state-owned or controlled uh, museum operation. The other part of preservation is what I would call the private preservation. We can look at those two sectors really by breaking them down a little bit further. If you look at the museum, and I've already mentioned it, you have the national or state-owned type museum. But then you can have a second museum which is a privately owned museum either privately owned on an individual basis or collectively. And if I take the uh, collective uh, type of museum, I probably would be looking at something uh, like the Glasgow Vintage uh, Vehicle Trust in Glasgow itself. The private individual, however, probably forms a very significant part of the bus preservation industry and in many ways may represent an easier uh, route to, private, to uh, preservation simply because as a private individual you're in control of your own destiny. You can decide uh, reasonably what you want to preserve, when you want to do it and what you want to achieve uh, in a private capacity. In a collective capacity, you're reliant on uh, agreeing with others at the very minimum. And I've always felt that when it comes to decision making, one person can make that decision uh, much more easily than uh, in a collective situation. Very often, preservation, especially from a museum point of view, will be coupled to charitable status. Now, charitable status um, is not easy to achieve um, in recent years. It has become much tougher, uh, many more hurdles to jump and to continually achieve um, and uh, take note of. Museums very often concentrate on certain uh, aspects of preservation um, and say we're talking about <coughs> bus preservation but if we look at specific aspects again I've mentioned it already you have the National Railway Museum which is very 
definitively drawn uh, in the railway field. I've mentioned the GBBT in Glasgow, which is very definitively drawn uh, in the bus preservation world. But there are many museums uh, which, of course, have a much wider remit. But I'll stick to the bus preservation, and I think that's the point where I want to really look uh, at what I would call the private preservation. That's the individual or the collective individuals uh, who are getting together to try to achieve something which they feel is important to achieve. Here in Northern Ireland, I could perhaps say that preservation, bus preservation, has probably in a way broken down into almost two sectors. And I would term that as pre-1960 and post-1960. Pre-1960, I feel represents the days of many of the types of vehicles that we have seen uh, previously from some of our uh, previous uh, uh, people. And that is the, the bonneted vehicles and the half cab vehicles, which really probably ceased to exist in a transport field here in Northern Ireland somewhere about the early to mid 70s. There are There is one person, and he's here today, who is very much, I think, and would agree that he is concentrated in that area. And when I talk about that area, really we're talking about vehicles that are effectively preserved from about the early to mid 1930s up to about the 1960 uh, time scale. The second time scale is the post-1960, um, and there are always exceptions to that. Like the pre-1960, there will still be uh, a number of vehicles which were the forerunners of what we probably see today, the vehicle with the driver sitting at the front and the door beside him um, and being operated in a one-man operation or today a one-person operation. And of course, there are a few exceptions which are post-1960, which are of the uh, half-cab type uh, vehicle. If we then look at preservation itself, in the private capacity, it's probably down to either what the person remembers, what they grew up with, that will determine perhaps what they want to preserve and how uh, they, uh, and specifically perhaps even not just what they want to preserve, but very specifically uh, particular vehicles within that time framework. Post 1960, you will find many more vehicles have been preserved, probably because they've been much more available. Um, time, of course, has a big effect in that. You go back to the vehicles of the 30s and 40s, they just don't exist nowadays. Uh, so you really have had to either have started at that time or been able uh, through investigations to identify a number of vehicles that may still exist uh, for one reason or another from that generation. <coughs> now, once you've decided that you want to be a preservationist, you really need to really stop and think what's going to be involved in that. And what's going to be involved in that, of course, is cost. Uh, there is a very significant cost. Now that cost is probably not going to particularly figure right at the very begin, beginning of your considerations. The actual cost of preservation, yeah. and that is the buying of a particular vehicle, probably not going to be that great. It may be scrap value, 
it may be a little bit more. It will of course be determined by the operator who owns the vehicle and who has uh, basically retired that vehicle. But you should think at that point in time about what other costs. I bought the vehicle or will be buying the vehicle. What other costs am I going to be faced with? And of course, it's very easy to ignore those until suddenly you discover that you have to consider them. You buy the vehicle, but you very often do not get the tires with it. So you've got to then consider, how do I get the tires? And how much are they going to cost me? But let's say you get to that point and you achieve your aim of buying the vehicle and you've got the tires to go with it. Can you actually drive it? Have you a license that will permit you to take it from wherever it is currently stored to wherever you want to take it to? And indeed, if you haven't got that license, have you somebody who does and will uh, provide the method of making that journey? But that's really only a first consideration. Second consideration is insurance. Can't take it on the public uh, highway unless I have appropriate insurance. <coughs> so another cost, can I get that call? Can I get that insurance? Um, do I need to meet certain conditions to get that insurance? And indeed, what are those conditions? Because there will be conditions of, uh, applied by the insurance company. The insurance can be got, I can assure anybody who hasn't been in preservation, yes you can get it, but it is not easy because you do, do need to consider exactly what you want, what you want covered. But having decided all of those and you're going to take the vehicle from the place where you have, uh, uh, from which you have purchased it, where do you take it to? You'll need storage accommodation. First thing that you might consider, well, if I can find a yard and store it in that yard, fine if you can. But I can tell you from long experience of preservation and being in the preservation movement, if you're thinking of outdoor storage, think twice, think three times. Outdoor storage will not do your preserved article any good whatsoever. In fact, it will very quickly <coughs> result in depreciation of the vehicle with the rot setting in, dampness setting in, um, and perhaps because it's lying outside, the paintwork is going to suffer very quickly as well. So if you've got to the point where you've considered all of those uh, aspects, Certainly, I think anybody in the preservation field, whether it be in a national status or a private status, will say, try to ensure that you have covered storage accommodation. And let's say you've got that covered storage accommodation, uh, and it gives you a, a protection from the weather. It might be a very good idea be able to ensure that it has power, that there's electricity, because presumably you'll need to work on the vehicle, or you'll need to get somebody to work on the vehicle, so you will need some facilities, uh, and power and light are obviously uh, top of the, that list. And let's assume you have all of that. What about expertise? Expertise that is to be able to actually work on with authority, to know the type of vehicle that you're dealing with and the things that you need to deal with. Buses, like cars, have got much more complex. Early buses are probably fairly straightforward if there's anything ever straightforward in preservation. Much later stuff, such as you see today, could be an absolute minefield, a real headache. 
I'm not going to that, but uh, because I think I'm right in saying that I don't think we have yet seen uh, in Northern Ireland uh, one of the current style of new floor buses preserved, but it probably will happen before very long. It certainly is happening uh, in England and Scotland. Let's assume that you identify the sort of skills and knowledge that are needed. Will you have those skills or knowledge or will you be able to get somebody else who has that skill and knowledge? And that becomes increasingly difficult uh, to get somebody who you might know with the skills and knowledge simply because as time passes the skills and knowledge of the earlier days, uh, the older buses become fewer and fewer uh, because we all eventually come to the end of the road. And don't forget as well that uh, that really then will take you to the point where if the vehicle is of a certain age, you will then still have to, as you do with your motor car, present it to the authorities for test. Now there are certain regulations nowadays which mean I think it's vehicles before 1960 do not have to be presented for test. But that doesn't remove your liability as the owner of the vehicle to ensure that it is kept in good running order. Remember if you purchase a bus, if you purchase any vehicle, but a bus in particular, you've got a lethal weapon. Um, because of its sheer size and its weight. So you really do need to think very carefully uh, about the condition in which you keep it. You could of course go for a privatization, which in many cases museums do, that they're there on static preservation uh, for the general public to come along and view with no real intention to ensure that they are mechanically sound for road operation because it would not be needed in those circumstances. But if you're a private pre preservationist, you will almost certainly want to get that vehicle that you own, or if you've more than one, the vehicles that you own out on the road sometime or other. So its condition is going to be paramount. On the area of, of tests, I, I should say, as many of you probably are well aware, the conditions that you have to meet to gain a test certificate in Northern Ireland are much more onerous than they are on the mainland. And if you doubt my word about that, I certainly know of one case where a vehicle came in with uh, a current test certificate would have, was due to be presented here uh, for renewal but its condition was such it couldn't possibly have met it, uh, the, 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 the standard here without very major uh, work being carried out on it. Then let's move forward uh, to the point where you've got your vehicle, you've restored it you can, of course, restore it to Concord and Elegance, uh, really top condition, probably even higher than it would have been when it left the factory brand new. Or you can decide to restore it to uh, good service operational condition, which might be the type of condition where it has just left uh, the uh, workshop having, been, having had its annual overhaul. And I would say that probably for many that latter is the way they would see it. To take it to the absolute top line condition is obviously going to add, add very significantly to the cost. But you're ready to go out on the road with the vehicle. How do you achieve that? I mentioned earlier, do you have a license? or do you have somebody who does have the license? Whichever way you uh, are going to operate, 
remember as a privately owned and run vehicle, you can't just simply go out onto the road and uh, pull in at the nearest bus stop and lift a crowd of passengers and charge them for the, the delights of traveling in that vehicle. That is just not, it's just not a starter. Your insurance will only cover you on a, a, a private uh, basis. It will not cover you for any commercial operation whatsoever. But even if it probably did, you would be in real trouble with the authorities and you would no doubt run into significant difficulties very quickly by the commercially operated bus companies. But if you do decide to, uh, that you can get over all of that, then remember the cost is going to be down to you. You're going to have to finance the running of that vehicle. Whichever way you decide to run that vehicle. And obviously, as a bus with a large engine, it's not going to produce the sort of fuel uh, economy that you get from your own car. Don't think you're going to get 30 to 40 miles to the gallon. You do very well, probably you get 10 miles to the gallon. And of course, the modern vehicles, I think, won't even achieve that sort of level. <coughs> So really what I've been driving at is not talking about buses in themselves um, because if I was to do that I think I would have had to have gone and done a lot more homework to find out just how many buses are preserved. I can say to you, and particularly for those of you who haven't really delved into the subject, that clearly the vehicles from the post-1960 time scale are much more numerous than those from the pre-1960 uh, and it's just down to uh, the case of uh, age and the age of all of us. Buses get older like everybody else and eventually come to the end of their useful life. There has been a greater uh, I suppose, interest uh, in preservation generally with probably more money available uh, to uh, carry out preservation activity than there, there would be in the past. But I would say to you that whilst there are significant numbers of vehicles, and maybe I should just say that there, you'll have seen a number of examples of that uh, up on the screen, that Pre-1960, probably the uh, bus, buses that uh, predominate are those of uh, Leyland chassis origin. But the same probably really uh, applies post-1960. Pre-1960, you will have had, such as 927, the double decker on the left. You also have uh, this guy, Arab, um, who Raymond uh, certainly knows rather better than me, but Leyland's do predominate. Post-1960, they said Leyland predominate, and probably the single make that has, uh, or the two makes that uh, predominate post-1960 are the Leyland Leopard and the Leyland Tiger. I don't know how many off the top of my head of each of those are preserved, but there are reasonably significant numbers. There are reasonable numbers of uh, Bristol uh, buses as well, which predominated through the 70s and the 80s in Belfast, almost to the exclusion of, of all other types. Um, but having said that, just a word of warning to anybody who is interested in bus preservation, and I really touched on it at an earlier stage. The older the bus, the more straightforward it is in terms of maintenance, but the more difficult it will be in terms of finding the parts that you need, because the passage of time, the parts just don't exist. Very much more recent vehicles are complex 
and very often the parts that might go wrong are not subject to being able to be fixed. It's very often the case, unfortunately, that you take them off, you throw them over your shoulder and you buy a new one at a rather high cost. So everything in what I've said to the preservationist or the budding preservationist is down really to cost. It's down to you whether you think right from the beginning you can get what you want at a reasonable cost and that you can continue to keep that vehicle at the sort of cost that you can afford. Because the one thing that is certain is it will not make money for you. It will always be a cost coming out of your pocket and nobody else's pocket. I think I have said enough. You've seen an example of a number of the vehicles that are preserved. Nearly all of you will be fully aware of what those are, so I haven't even attempted to tell you about them. Many of you will know them far better than I. But what I've been really trying to say, if there's anybody out there that hasn't got into preservation but thinks that they would like to, it's really not so much a word of warning but rather a word of, well, think long and hard, understand what's likely to be involved and bottom line, it will be your pocket that will be meeting all the issues that arise. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I came to the province in trying to remember, 1967, New Year's Day virtually, uh, re recruited to be a personal assistant to Werner Heubeck, who had been appointed the man general manager or managing director designate for the new bus company. Uh, a little bit of background, you probably know the Ulster Transport Authority had run trains, buses, road freight and indeed six hotels, but was a massive drain on public funds and the government had decided to break it up into its element parts and set up uh, subsidiary companies uh, to deal with them. Now there's a couple of points on public policy I think I would, uh, I would like to mention to you. First of all, they had a policy that the bus system was not viable as a total entity. The plan was to hive off routes and groups or groups of routes in rural areas which were deemed unremunerative. The figures of course were all supplied by the UTA. The new company would only retain the remunerative routes, essentially the trunk routes and the urban areas. Two such groups of routes had been established during 1965, Shoreline Coaches of Lurgan and Coastal Bus Services of Port Rush. There were quite significant differences between those two groups, but I won't go into that at the moment. But Werner Heubeck, in his study of the system, he had about a year before taking over uh, to, to prepare himself and to prepare the new company. Uh, he quickly realized that the problem with the UTA's assessments was that their accountancy was pretty unreliable. The bus accounts were heavily loaded with an item called other traffic and general charges, which turned out to be mainly overhead costs belonging elsewhere, e.g. the railways. He concluded that the bus business could and would be successful in its entirety and all discussions on further franchising were called off. Another policy which misfired was that the businesses set up to replace the UTA would be jointly controlled by the new Northern Ireland Transport Holding Company and by the existing British Transport Holding Company. No doubt this was intended to spread the cost away from the Northern Ireland public purse if the companies lost money. 
This had started with the first company to be formed, Northern Ireland Carriers, which took on the road freight division of the UTA, shared between NITHC and National Freight Corporation, a subsidiary of the THC. The vehicle, if I can call it that, selected by the transport holding company for the bus business in Northern Ireland was to be the Scottish Bus Group, a large organisation but smaller than the corresponding national bus company in England and Wales. I can remember an official visit by the Scottish directors very early in 1967. I'd only been here about five or six weeks at that stage. But soon after that, Werner called us together to tell us that the Scottish bus group had chickened out and that Ulster bus would go it alone under the wing, entirely under the wing of the Northern Ireland Transport Holding Company. He told us that it was probably for the best and that we would be able to make our own decisions. I strongly suspect that the Scottish bus group <coughs> didn't really have a great deal of faith in Werner Heubeck. He was a man with no transport background and no indeed professional qualifications. Uh, he'd come out of the paper making industry, um, he'd been in a number of other industries, um, but he was a very remarkable man. He talked himself into that job, uh, much to everyone's surprise, and I cannot think of anybody who could have led the company through the problems that we subsequently had in the, uh, in the 70s and the 80s. Indeed, in the years that followed, we saw that the Scottish bus group, despite their professional qualifications, were very old-fashioned and conservative crowd, from which we were very glad to be separate. And I say that as an expatriate Scot. Now, a word on one-man operation, and it was called that in those days. It may not be politic nowadays, but it was. And indeed, all our platform staff were men in those days. We, we, we soon changed that, but uh, that was the situation. By 1966, it was very clear that the future of public transport lay with one-man operation, doing away with bus conductors. Both the UTA and the BCT already had agreements with the trade unions covering one-man operation of single-decker buses, but implementation had been fairly slow. Double-deckers would be a challenge of an entirely different character, but that was to be faced in the future. The UTA still had more than 200 old-type rear-entrance 34-seaters, you've seen one or two on the screen, uh, in service. So the first priority for Ulsterbus was to convert all the suitable vehicles to one-man operation working and to source sufficient vehicles to replace the remaining older types from the day the company launched. Another point I'd like to make about bus fares. The UTA had not been allowed to increase fares since 1963 despite rising inflation. But fares in Northern Ireland were recognized to be higher than the general level in Britain for comparable journeys. There were two factors to this. Firstly, throughout Britain, the general level of bus fares was around half of the comparable train fares. Buses were generally commercial at that time, but railways were already requiring substantial public subsidy. So, you know, the figures were more like that. Uh, however, around the British Isles, and I'm taking the whole Isles here, three large organisations operated both trains and buses within their territories, London Transport, Ulster Transport and CIE. And each of these had a policy to charge the same scale of fares on both bus and rail systems. In truth, passengers were travelling on their buses were paying more than the operating costs, while those travelling by train were paying a lot less. As part of his plan for the new company, Werner Heubeck gave the government 
a further undertaking not to increase fares for another three years. Now this was honoured despite raging inflation and this did much to restore some comparison between fares in Northern Ireland and in the mainland. Another feature of UTA fares policy was that their scale was based on what we call a straight line scale. I'm getting very technical here. The fare rate per mile was constant throughout the mileage scale. Thus, a 60 mile journey cost twice the fare for a 30 mile journey, which was twice the fare for a 15 mile trip, and so on. This wasn't actually well justified on cost economics. The largest item of cost in the bus business is the driver's wage, based entirely upon time. He's paid so much an hour. But the longer distance journeys were taken on express or limited stop services covered at a higher average speed and thereby encouraging, uh, incurring lower wage costs per mile. This justified a gradual change over 10 or 20 years to what we call a tapered scale in which the charge per mile progressively declines. Another feature of our activity in regard to fares was a very effective push to simplify the fares system to help our staff, now one-man operators, and to reduce printing costs. We also coped with changes to currency, deletion of the half penny, old penny, for example, and the switch to decimal currency. Some of you may recall that at that time, Irish coinage was circulating quite freely in Northern Ireland. And we claimed to be the only organization to have trained staff to recognize and accept and deal with both sets of decimal coinage. A few years later, we had to deal with the separation of the pound from the Irish pound, which necessitated dual currency fares lists for cross-border routes and in due course the adoption of the euro in place of the punt for the same routes. Uh, if you want to study the fares in detail, there are fare books now lodged with the Transport Museum. Um, you would see the Ulster Transport Fare books were two large volumes about that size and it gradually reduced to an Ulster bus volume about this size for the same network of routes, but we managed to, to simplify it and reduce the, the amount of paper involved. Now, I can, uh, time permitting, uh, I can go on to talk about the bus fleet. As I said, the large, no, I hadn't said this, the, the last new buses purchased by the UTA had been in 1963 apart from a small group of express coaches in 65. The economic life of a bus at that time and to this day is assessed as 14 to 16 years. So you have to think of that as a, the life of a generation of buses. And 50 years represents several generations. Many of the UTA buses had served since 1946-7, nearly 20 years, and even slightly younger types were acknowledged to be getting expensive to maintain. I already mentioned the priority of obtaining vehicles suitable for OMO. Happily, during 1966, the designate team of managers had assembled over 100 suitable buses from second-hand sources in three large batches 45 Leyland Royal Tigers from Ribble were 14 years of age. The other two batches were much younger. 15 Leyland Leopards from Western SMT were only about two years old. Uh, 15, sorry, uh, the third batch were 48 Leyland Tiger Cubs from Edinburgh Corporation, only seven years old. And they were buses that I used to go out on my bicycle when I was at university and chase up to see which ones had been delivered uh, that day uh, or within recent days 
uh, and that batch were disposed of because they'd at long last managed to deal with some low bridges and were able to transfer to change over to double deckers on those routes. So on top of these, the company had been enabled by a good bank overdraft arrangement to commit to a fleet of new vehicles to be delivered in time for the launch. Two small batches of six touring coaches and seven express coaches were on conventional heavyweight Leyland chassis, while 70 were lightweight Bedford chassis with English built bodies, stretching the money over the greatest number of vehicles, although selection of the Leyland engine option in the Bedfords gave us some standardization with the UTA fleet. These allowed almost all of the old 34 seaters to be phased out for disposal. By good chance, a new school transport regime was being set up in the Republic of Ireland and they happily bought up many of these obsolete vehicles. After the new company launched on 17th April 1967, the bottom line on our accounts started to show a positive return and we were able to formulate plans for the long-term fleet replacement. We identified four types of bus we would need to purchase. Double-deckers in limited numbers, suitable for one-man operation and as large as currently legal, which was up to 86 seats. Front entrance, rear-engine models were now readily available. Two, uh, a limited number of single-deck buses specified for city services were needed urgently for Londonderry. Again, the rear engine layout was attractive and was available from several makers, although some models had been pushed out very hurriedly for one-man operation and were earning a reputation for unreliability. Thirdly, we felt that a lightweight model would be quite adequate for much of our dispersed rural territory. And fourthly, for the bulk of our single leg purchases, we recognise that a good heavyweight chassis would be a wise investment. Recent legislation permitted up to 11 metres overall length, which could accommodate up to 53 seats <coughs> and up to 24 standing, sufficient to readily replace most of the double deck fleet. Underfloor engines had become the norm, allowing for passenger for luggage boots to cater for passengers' baggage as well as our own substantial bus parcel traffic on trunk routes. The same type of chassis with variations in body style and seating could also handle touring and express coach services. So the first order on this plan covered 75 vehicles to be delivered in 1968. 20 Bristol RELLs were specified for Londonderry City. Interestingly, a chassis which suffered none of the problems of its competitors and which had been originally designed not for city work but for a wide range of interurban operations in England. Ten Bristol LH lightweight buses were bought for rural routes and the balance of 45 chassis were Leyland Leopards with a mix of five express service bodies, 20 dual purpose, 49 seaters, I should say perhaps multi-purpose, and 20 53 seater basic buses with uh, fairly basic seating. Later that year the process resumed but on the basis of purchasing 300 buses over four years assuring both ourselves of a continuous supply and the manufacturers of a longer planning period. This order included 40 double-deckers, Leyland Atlantean 85-seaters, and 260 Leyland Leopards over the same three seating variants. From 1973, lightweight rural buses came back on stream with 250 Bristol LH Bedford YRQ and Bedford YLQ delivered between 1973 and 1976. From 1975 onwards, the bulk purchases were mainly of the full-size heavyweight models. The Leyland Leopard continued to meet Ulsterbus needs for interurban and express operation. By the time that model ceased production in 1983, 709 chassis had been supplied. 
The leopard was then replaced by the tiger, also a mid-end underfloor engine design, which met most of our needs very well. Meanwhile, in Belfast, in 1973, during the reorganization of local government, the opportunity was taken to relieve the city of Belfast of their loss-making public transport organization and transfer it to the NITHC, where it was placed under common management with Ulsterbus, as if we didn't have enough headaches. But anyhow, ironically, there was virtually no commonality between the bus, the two bus fleets. The BCT fleet was largely standardized on Daimler chassis with Gardner engines, neither of which had featured at all in the UTA fleet. However, most contemporary engineers and many operators acknowledged the Gardner engine as, at the time, the best that money could buy. In Ulsterbus, we had wanted to include the Gardner engine option in the Bristol RELLs that we bought for Derry. But the extra cost, 11% on the chassis, and the departure from standardization, that simply wasn't feasible. It wasn't realistic. Among the BCT fleet, at, this is in 1973, was a residue of 24 guy Arabs, you've seen one of them, dating from 1950, already 23 years of age at that time. Another large batch of Daimlers dated from 1952. Clearly replacement of these old vehicles had to be given as much priority as we could afford. After a first order for 40 Leyland Atlanteans delivered in 1975-6, the decision was made to cease buying double-deckers and to concentrate on high-capacity single-deckers. This, I freely admit, was a Hoybeck decision uh, based on his continental uh, background. Uh, he was well ahead of the, of the uh, field in concentrating on single-deckers in an urban area. Uh, these could take generous numbers of standing passengers as well as those seated. The Bristol RELL with the Gardner engine became the standard vehicle. We were equally, uh, it was equally suitable for urban areas served by Ulster bus, so we quite happily took exactly the same vehicle. Uh, in, well, I say exactly, there was a very slight difference in the gearing. <coughs> we gave City bus four gears and Ulster bus had five gears. So it had a slightly higher top speed capability. Initially, the city bus vehicles with a center door had 32 seats and 40 standing, but Ulster bus vehicles were fully seated with 52 seats and 24 standing and only the, the door at the front. Later on, to, some of you may remember those vehicles being described as Hybex cattle wagons. Um, it was unfortunate. But uh, later, uh, after Ted Hesketh took over, to counter the bad image created by those vehicles, the seating capacity was increased to 43, uh, with a slight reduction in standing space. Although the Leyland Group, which by then included the Bristol Mark, tried to stop production of the RELL toward the end of the 70s decade, they had nothing acceptable to offer us and we were able to secure continued production of that chassis until about 1983. Indeed some of the last to be completed were actually stored for a couple of years until 1985. By then a total of 600 of this type had been supplied to the two companies. It was rather entertaining actually Leyland said, oh, we can't, they, they were pushing the Leyland National to their, which was totally built in one of their factories, a uh, complete vehicle, and they were pushing that very hard. They, they virtually forced the English industry to accept a national instead of alternatives, and they tried to do the same with us, and we said, no, we want bodywork built in Northern Ireland, we want to support our local economy. So. Uh, 
The first device to get round Leyland's obduracy, because they didn't want to be continuing to build the Bristol for us when they weren't selling it in England. So it was declared to be a model for export market, and Northern Ireland became an export market. <laughs> we weren't the only export market. New Zealand had exactly the same attitude, and uh, so the, the final batches of REs were built for Northern Ireland alternately with New Zealand. <coughs> Leyland failed to offer us an acceptable successor to the Bristol REL. We tried out batches of their B21, which was a chassis version of the Leyland National, and their Lynx, which was their successor to the National. And we cast our eyes widely elsewhere in the absence of an alternative, some 145 mid-engine Tiger chassis, the Tiger buses, were allocated to city bus between 1988 and 1992. Leyland bus was bought out by its own management in January 1987, but that new company did not have resources sufficient to develop its model range to cope with rapidly developing European legislation or to regain the many customers that had been lost over the previous decade of high-handedness. Volvo bus stepped in and took over the ailing company in 1988. Very soon the historic Leyland name had all but disappeared. The power unit of the Leyland Tiger chassis had been the Leyland TL11 engine, the final development of a Leyland engine design which had been around since the early post-war years. This was actually built by the Leyland truck factory which decided to cease production of that engine around 1988. Leyland bus tried to offer us Gardner or Cummins engines as alternatives but both required very extensive and clumsy modifications to the main chassis frames, which were not acceptable. We knew that the Volvo engine fitted into the Tiger chassis like a hand into a glove. Indeed, Volvo had already publicly promoted its engine as a service replacement for the Tiger coach, for Tiger coach operators. Yet even after Volvo had acquired Leyland, we still had to fight them to persuade them to buy, to, to fit the Volvo engine into the Tiger chassis. And once again, they conceded as an export device. We were the only customer entitled to buy that particular model. After that, uh, we, we actually had 245 Tigers of that design. When I say that, there was actually one operator in Britain got four of them, but they were actually peeled off our order um, and were sold on condition that they were built in the Belfast factory. The bodywork was built in, in Belfast out of our order. Uh, after that, we had to switch to the equivalent Volvo chassis, the B10M, of which we had 140 delivered in 1995 and 6, but not before we had again evaluated the alternatives. By 1994, the industry at large was moving towards the concept of low floors and step-free access for the sake of elderly and disabled clientele. We tried 40 Dennis Darts in 1994, a smallish bus, uh, bus with lower steps and floor, with the choice of DAF coaches, DAF chassis for coaches. We were showing Volvo that we could go elsewhere. After one batch of Volvo B10L with Alexander's Ultra bodies delivered in 1996-7, we concentrated on higher quality coach chassis for gold line service <coughs> for a year or two. Our next supply of service buses were Volvo B10 BLE with the Wright's renowned bodywork and by this time low floor was uh, widespread. 
Indeed, it's fair to say that rights as bodybuilders <coughs> were uh, at the forefront of persuading the industry that this was the direction we should be going. Not just us, but the rest of the industry as well. By this time, this is about 2001, we were also buying double-deckers again after a gap of more than 25 years. These were Volvo B7TL with Alexander's bodies, but the following batches had Wright's bodies as Alexander had closed their Belfast factory. An unfortunate consequence of European rules for public service procurement has been that the sound old concepts of standardization and buying local to support the local economy have been virtually outlawed. Nowadays, different suppliers offering comparable specification at a better deal must be favored. Thus, Scania have secured major orders since 2001, and recent purchases have included bodies from Spain and Belgium instead of Northern Ireland. Whether Brexit will change all that remains to be seen. And now I want to move on to, if time will permit, uh, I want to move on to operations. From April 1967, Ulsterbus maintained a full network of public transport services which they had inherited from the UTA. There were, admittedly, a progressive slow decline in the total number of passenger journeys. This was a national trend caused by increased car ownership and prosperity. It was not helped in our province by the effect of the troubles. Civil disorder discouraged passengers and indeed at times prevented the operation of buses in, 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 on a short term basis. Against that, however, the numbers of school children travelling by bus was increasing year on year. Assuming greater importance as a percentage of the total, 17% in 1967 had grown to 35% by 1987. Cross-border services. A cross-border service, express service between Londonderry and Dublin had been introduced by the UTA stroke CIE in 1965 with the closure of the Great Northern Railway. Ulster Bus and CIE building on that by launching services from Belfast to Galway in 1967 and others during the 1970s such as Coleraine Dublin, Belfast Sligo Achill, Aldergrove Letterkenny, Dunlow Oma and the major Interlink Ireland operation, a series of daily express services from all corners of Ireland which met and interchanged passengers at Athlone. We provided the links from Belfast and from Londonderry. We dearly wanted to try Belfast Dublin, but this was frustrated by the protectionist policies of both governments until a breakthrough in 1989. Since when the service has prospered without, it seems, any detriment to railway traffic. Indeed, there are now other operators licensed to compete on that route. Airport. From the outset, we could see that the link between Aldergrove and Belfast, which had operated on an as-required basis to connect with individual flights, was capable of development. Direct services between Aldergrove and the west and south of the province were tried between 1971 and 76, but failed to generate sufficient business. However, on the Belfast route, a regular frequency service with luxury coaches was introduced in 1974. Frequency was increased, but with small vehicles, in 1988. By 2003, large single-deckers took over, and nowadays, the services worked with double-deckers on an even greater frequency. Express services. We developed a range of new or improved services under the Ulsterbus Express branding during the early years. However, a major step forward was the rebranding under the Gold Line 
name in 1990. This included a brand new service between Derry and Belfast over Glen Shane. It had taken me 12 years to persuade my colleagues that we should be doing this. And it has proved outstandingly successful. I have often freely admitted that it exceeded my wildest expectations. What started as a twice daily service is now half hourly all day and even more frequent at peak times and much of the capacity is with double deck luxury coaches. Frequency improvements have also been made on services to Belfast from Enniskillen, Oma, Dungannon, Armagh, Newry, Newcastle, Downpatrick, Larne, Ballymena, Coleraine and Nimavady and no doubt one or two other places that I've forgotten to list. And then the Belfast periphery from the outside, Werner Heubeck recognised that there was business to be done around the periphery of Belfast, an area we would neglect at our peril. The UTA had surrendered territory around Glenvormley and uh, in, the, in the Dundonald area when BCT replaced their trolley buses with more flexible diesel bus routes. There were still several points around the interface between the companies where advantage could be gained by one or the other undertaking, by more route horse trading. Agreement was reached for an exchange of territory in 1970 when Ulsterbus surrendered the route to Four Winds in exchange for the BCT withdrawing from the competitive route they had introduced to Tully Carnot. Later transfers of territory included the Ladybrook in 1971 and Glen Road in 1972. Much more recently, under the scheme to rebrand city buses Metro, large areas of Newton Abbey and Dundonald as well as the Conway Estate on Lisburn were transferred from one undertaking to the other. Cross-channel services are worth a mention, I think having been personally responsible for much of this area. Uh, a few years after withdrawal of the direct shipping routes, Board Fulcher felt it necessary or desirable to promote direct express coach routes between Glasgow and Dublin in 1969, and with Ulster bus involvement, Glasgow Derry in 1970 and Bundoran in 1971. Middlesbrough Belfast followed in 1974, utilising a licence which had existed in the past for hotel-based tourist package traffic. The withdrawal of the belfast Haysham overnight ferry in 1975 was the trigger for major expansion of this concept. Ulsterbus developed Belfast Blackpool that year to uh, provide for passengers who were left unserved by the withdrawal of the Haysham route. Um, and that led to discussions with the Scottish bus group about Belfast to London and th that route started the following year. Following the pattern, very successful over many years, Edinburgh and Glasgow both had direct routes to London and that had been extended northwards to uh, Aberdeen and Inverness. So we had a, a Belfast, Stranraer, London direct service. Um, we had a, a Belfast to Glasgow route in the same year. With the deregulation of express services in, in uh, GB in 1980, Ulsterbus set about devising routes to work with its own coaches based at the tour department's depot in Stranraer. Belfast, Scarborough, Bristol and Leicester followed. By 1988, the total cross-channel business was worth over £2 million per annum. Since then, Ulsterbus has greatly increased its share of the total mainland operations, uh, although the rise in low-cost air services has dented the total business available. I mentioned at the beginning of my talk the uh, coastal and shoreline 
Both of those operations were ultimately brought back into the Ostrobus fold. Uh, Coastal was acquired in 1974 on retirement of the proprietor H.R. Robinson. Shoreline of Lurgan had been a thorn in our flesh in the Craigavon area and a territorial agreement was arrived at in 1974 which enabled Ulsterbus to assume entire responsibility for the Craigavon new town area. Um, this actually, Shoreline had rather overreached themselves and by concentrating their activities somewhat, uh, it really put them back on their feet as well as avoiding this thorn in the flesh situation in Craig Allen because they were objecting to everything that we did and we were objecting to what they were doing and so on. Um, and eventually uh, they survived for another uh, almost 15 years and the business was acquired by Ulster Bus again on the retirement of the proprietor Joe English in 1987. Uh, we also took over a time service in Straban which had been started by a local operator uh, in Donnell uh, with two minibuses. Talking about minibuses we had commenced Flexibus as a, a subsidiary company in 1984 providing private hire and experimental services with small buses and that developed into what we called busy bus um, which commenced in 1987 to operate town services throughout the province such as Bangor, Newton Arts, Lisburn, Newry, Banbridge, <coughs> Londonderry, Coleraine, Ballymena, Oma, Enniskillen and Antrim and any more you can think of. Uh, Initially, we used 19-seater van conversions, uh, mostly built in our own workshops, uh, but these were replaced uh, by 19, from 1989 by 25-seater uh, conventional chassis on body uh, vehicles. Gradually, those have tended to disappear. There are still some small buses around but they're a bit bigger than even the 25-seaters and in most cases, in many cases, the services themselves have been sufficiently successful to be turned into single-deck operation. Uh, another factor has been that the economies of running small buses have dwindled away, particularly on the, on the driver's wage side. Uh, all, the, all the drivers are now paid. The, the initially was a, a lower rate for many buses, but they now get the standard. Rate, so they might as well be driving the standard bus. Uh, from 1990 onwards, we were very active in the field of bus priorities. This was again it was one of my specialities, uh, and we did a lot of work uh, with road service, uh, very good cooperation with road service. Amongst the achievements were the City Express service from Newton Abbey into Belfast via the M2 motorway, uh, which was to demonstrate the efficiency of a fast service using uh, a, a fast corridor. Um, we tried to develop that theme for what was known as the super route, the southern approaches, we wanted to develop a bus-only road uh, in from um, south, from, from the Carrie Duff direction, uh, into the city centre. Um, and the E-way was to use the old railway, county, uh, county down railway formation uh, from Dundonald into Belfast as a bus route, bus only route. Unfortunately neither of those major developments have have seen uh, the light of day but we tried. Uh, we did get a bus route established on the West Link from the, the big roundabout uh, at um, the back of the uh, Royal Victoria. Um, 
Uh, that comes in alongside the railway and in through our own depot and that has saved express buses going out uh, in and out of Belfast uh, several minutes of, of traffic congestion time uh, getting in and out. We produced a joint uh, best practice guide to the design of bus stops, uh, how they should be laid out on the highway and marked and that sort of thing. We had experiments with a system of selective vehicle detection, which nobody could see, but the bus was triggering the traffic lights ahead of it as it approached, and uh, um, generally was allowed a few seconds uh, earlier change on the lights. Um, that operated on the <coughs> Upper Newton Arch Road. I have no idea whether it's still functioning, uh, but that was way back in the 90s. Uh, another of our achievements was getting a slip road built from uh, Dromore onto the A1, which didn't involve coming out and crossing both streams of traffic. Um, then again, park and ride was being developed. Uh, we had a, There was a park and ride system on the north side of Belfast that had been started, I think, as far back as the corporation days, but uh, it was revamped and uh, uh, a bus stop facility was provided with a quick turnaround and a minibus shuttling between there and the city centre, and that's still functioning. A similar operation started on the east side um, with a specially provided bus turning circle. Uh, and then that business has been extended to out-of-town bus and train stations, particularly since the formation of, of TransLink. And then we have the purpose-built park-and-ride car parks at Sprucefield, Cairns Hill and Ballyrobin. And there's another one which I've forgotten the name of, uh, up the, uh, uh, just on the, uh, on the M1, or near the M1. Uh, and that's as, that's as much as my notes have gone. I, I, sorry for going on a bit long, but I did realize that covering 50 years, uh, which I have been through personally, the whole of it, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a challenge. So thank you very much.